Merry Christmas to you and your family as we begin this Christmas sermon series for Christmas 2022. This series for the next four weeks, culminating on Christmas Sunday, Christmas Day, is the gift and the gifts of Christmas. The gift and the gifts of Christmas. So I want to begin with that question to which there is a correct answer, although many good answers can be given. What is the greatest gift from God? Think to yourself, what is the greatest gift God gives to us? And to get at your answer, maybe we could quote from Family Feud. Survey says, here's my guess about the top three that you would name. Number one, forgiveness. If you didn't name forgiveness, number two, peace. Or some of you may be more emotional types, number three, joy. Those are all great gifts, but they flow from one gift. Sometimes as evangelicals, and as Baptists in particular, we so emphasize the legal aspect of forgiveness that what you owe God is gotten rid of, removed amnesty, that we don't think about all of the benefits. Forgiveness is great, but you are forgiven because of something. Peace is wonderful, blessed peace, but it flows from a greater gift, and joy is the same way. That great gift is the impossible adoption. The impossible adoption that we have a relationship with God that we have been brought into his family. It's ironic that people in the world, unbelievers, assume they have a relationship with God. People say, I have a relationship with God. Well, they do, but it's not a good one. To be brought into a healthy, holy, happy relationship with God is the greatest miracle of all time. And we see that at Christmas as God brings his son into the world for that very purpose. Now again, that's a big claim that the greatest gift is adoption. So let me give you my famous, sorry, favorite passage about Christmas is not in the Gospels. It is famous, but it's my favorite. Galatians 4, 4 through 5. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. You see in that passage, Christmas, Christ comes, that he might redeem Easter, that we might receive adoption. We celebrate the beginning of this process, the beginning of the church calendar at Christmas because the first step in making you and I the sons and daughters of God is that Christ has to come. He comes as a baby born in impossible birth to bring about an impossible reality that you and I could be born into God's family, that we could be born again, that we could be in Christ. And in Christ we could say, our Father who art in heaven, the greatest miracle. And from that gift of family relationship flow forgiveness and peace and joy and assurance and boldness and everything else you could possibly name. Now, as we begin this series, I want to say that most Christmas series focus on the upper branches of the Christmas tree. I want you to imagine a Christmas tree and the upper branches are usually our Christmas stories. We usually begin with the New Testament and the upper branches closest to the star Jesus are these. We usually talk about Elizabeth and Zechariah. We talk about Mary and Joseph and then the star Jesus. And that's right. In fact, next week we'll begin that. Next week we'll begin with Elizabeth and Zechariah and we'll begin to climb towards the star of the show, the star at the top of the Christmas tree. But those are the upper branches, Matthew 1 and Luke 1 through 2. But I noticed in our Bibles that the New Testament is the back half, the back third. That the Christmas story is the back third, the Christ child. But what about the Old Testament? 
What about the 39 books that preceded? And indeed, Matthew 1, 1, the first verse says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew begins with a list that takes us back in the Old Testament. And so if the typical Christmas stories that we're going to begin with next week, messages 2, 3, and 4, are the upper branches, let's look at the lower branches. Because just like you might have a gift you're going to give somebody, something really great, and you just can't help it, you're, you're just bursting with excitement, so maybe you draw hints, maybe you suggest some things to you're smiling all the time because you just can't wait for them to unwrap that gift. So it seems in the Old Testament, God is so excited about the coming of His Son that He does a series of impossibilities as hints. And so that's what I want us to look at today under the sermon title, Old Time Christmas, The History of the Impossibles. And there's a link there. In Genesis, God says, is anything too difficult for the Lord? That's Genesis 18, 14, spoken to Abraham. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? And obviously the answer is no, nothing is impossible for him. And then in the words to Mary, when she asks how she can give birth to an impossible son since she's a virgin, Gabriel says, Luke 1, for nothing will be impossible with God. That one word links our Christmas stories together. That God does the impossible to make us the impossible children of God. So let's begin here at the very beginning. Now, uh, if you're following along with the Christmas tree on the screen or you're following along at home, I'm envisioning a Christmas tree and we're going to begin with the lower branches and go up. So we're at the very bottom, the very body ornament would be Eve, the mother of humanity. Eve. Now, in all of these situations, the impossible can only happen when there's a problem. Right? If you're having a really good day, you don't need the impossible to happen. But if you're sitting in the ER with your loved one, you need the impossible, right? Uh, when things are going well financially, you don't need the impossible. But when the bills are higher than your income, you need the impossible. And so in all of these situations, all of these hints in the Old Testament, there's a problem. And Eve has the biggest problem. What's the problem that Eve faces? All of humanity is dying from the fall. There's no hope here. Let me read Genesis 3.19. This is God's curse spoken to Adam and Eve. Till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. God had a great plan. There would be humans on the earth from him and for him. Adam and Eve and their children would live in a relationship with God, and he would be their God, and they would be their people, and it would be wonderful. And they blew it, and sin entered the human race. And now as we come to this first impossibility, Adam and Eve are looking at their own bodies, who now begin to age and will die. Is God's plan over? This is like a cliffhanger in a movie or a television series. What will happen? Will this be the end? Here comes the impossible promise. The first promise of Christmas. Genesis 3.15. Mark it in your Bibles. Genesis 3.15. The first promise about the Messiah. God says to the serpent, to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. You he will strike his heel. It's a beautiful promise to Eve. Adam, although they might not have fully understood it, meant two things. One is, Eve, you're going to have children. Even though you've begun to die, you will pass on to every generation children, and they will have children, and I will continue the human race. Every human being who's ever lived will die because they're sinners. We know that's the case. But I will rescue humanity through the birth in every generation. And then someday, Eve, a very special son, a grandson of a grandson of a grandson of a grandson, sounds like the genealogy is right, of Matthew and Luke. Someday, Eve, one of your seeds, one of your descendants, will take down Satan, who's caused this. Here we have Jesus, right? That Satan struck him on the heel, he's wounded, he's killed, he's buried, he's resurrected. Here we have the impossibility that through humanity, through the God-made man, the God-man Jesus, 
this Old Testament Christmas promise would come true, and he would defeat Satan. Eve, the mother of all humanity, facing the impossible, that she's going to die, gets the promise, the Christmas promise, that a baby would come from her lineage and save the world. And we're just getting started here. Then we move on to Sarah, the mother of Israel. Your father Abraham had many sons, and many sons of father Abraham, right? You know that song. Sarah, or Sarai, the mother of Israel, who becomes Sarah. Well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that uh, Abram and Sarai, who become Abraham and Sarah, have been married 70 plus years, and they don't have any children. So bad is the situation that in Genesis 11, 29, when we're introduced to Sarai, we're told she's barren, she has no children. It's like Moses writes it down twice. The first thing we learn about Sarah, Abraham's wife, is she can't have children. And that's proven for 70 years. In fact, the story of Sarah not having children stretches from Genesis 11, 29, all the way to Genesis 21, 2. It is perhaps the longest story in the Bible. It stretches 10 chapters. Will Sarah have children? It's impossible. She can't. Think about celebrating your 50th wedding anniversary with no children, and God comes along and says, you'll have a child. God promises to Abraham that they will have children through Sarah, and they wait 10 more years, and then God doubles down with the promise again, and Abraham, about 100 years old, and Sarah in her 90s. See the fulfillment of this. Here's the impossible promise to the impossible situation. Genesis 17, 6. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. You see, God doesn't just do small impossibilities. Sarah and Abraham, you have no children. But not only are you going to have children, I'm going to make nations plural out of you and rulers. Wow. Kings and nations. And they believed that promise. They believed the impossible, that God would do it. And God did do it. He brought up Isaac, whom they named Laughter. You know, there's an important principle here. As we think about the Old Testament and the promise of the impossible, do you know that the Old Testament saints were saved by believing the impossible? Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed in the Lord, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. How was Abraham saved? God made an impossible promise, and Abraham said, I trust you, Lord. I believe against all hope, I believe against all I see that what you said would come true. And God said, righteous, saved Abraham. And as it was then, it has been in every generation. As we move through the Old Testament towards the coming of Jesus, understand that all the saints were saved by faith in God's promises, specifically promises about the coming deliverer. Paul, in Romans 4, quotes the passage from Abraham and says this, this was written for our sake, to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him, here come the impossibilities, who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So here we have it. You and I are saved because we believe Jesus came as God in human flesh. He lived, he died, and was resurrected. And Paul says, when you believe the impossible, that God became man and sacrificed himself for us. You're saved just like Abraham. And so descendants come from Abraham and Sarah, and time continues on, and every generation is the call to believe in the impossible, to believe in the God that will someday bring forth the Messiah. I think here of Hebrews 11, 32, it's an interesting verse for us. The writer says, and what shall, more shall I say, for time would fail me if I tell you. The writer's been giving these long stories of the heroes and heroines of the faith, including the ones I just mentioned. And then he comes and says, I can't tell you all the people of faith. And he just mentions off a few. 
Time will fail me, so I feel that as a preacher, I'm only going to give you a few. I'm going to give you five more impossibilities from the Old Testament. So, again, we're climbing the Christmas tree. We've got an ornament there for Eve, the possible mother of humanity, and an ornament there for, uh, for Sarah, the impossible mother of Israel, to which we would add Rachel, Jacob's wife, one of his wives. What's the problem? The problem is that she can't have children for a long time. Her rival, the other wife, her sister, is having children left and right. And poor Rachel, she can't have any children. In fact, Genesis 29, 31 makes it quite clear. It says Rachel was barren. But then God makes a promise. God brings it about. And God gives her a special son, much better known than the mother. You may struggle to remember who Rachel is, but you know who her son is, Joseph. Joseph, king of Egypt, right? Prince of Egypt. Joseph, the mighty one, the deliverer. Joseph, who leads the people. And like Jesus, in whose lineage he is, Joseph will be hated. He's hated by his brothers. He, he's almost killed. He's falsely accused. He's shunned. He's left for dead. Remind you of Jesus. And then he becomes the impossible son of rescue. And guess who he rescues? He rescues the very family who hated him. And here comes Jesus centuries later, and Jesus is not understood by his family. He's rejected by the Jews. He's left for dead, and he becomes the impossible redeemer who makes us the children of God. So we have ornament for Eve, we have ornament as we climb the tree. For Sarah, we have an ornament for Rachel, and then we have one for whose name we don't know. We have an unnamed woman who appears in the pages of Judges. She is also barren. And an angel comes and makes a promise to her and to her husband that she would give birth to a son, and lo and behold, Samson, the mighty man of God. Now I know as soon as I say Samson, you and I immediately think of his failures. His foolishness, his women problems, he, he's not a very good man. But written into the pages of Judges, we read that he led his nation and he protected them for 20 years. Yes, he's foolish. He's a lot like Solomon. He makes a lot of mistakes. But behind the scenes, he leads and protects his people for 20 years. He is a mighty judge in the book of Judges. And, like Jesus, he voluntarily accepts his death to accomplish God's purposes. Remember Samson blinded, and he puts his arms out on the pillars, and the pagans are worshiping their gods, and what's he do? He prays, he trusts his soul to God, and he brings down that pillar, and the judge says he killed more in his death than his lifetime. Who does Samson look like? Well, he looks like Jesus. What's God doing? He's hinting. He's telling us what the deliverer is going to look like. The one who's going to bring his adoption into God's son. Here we are. We have another Samson. Born to a barren woman. Hang another ornament for the unnamed woman. The heroine. The one who raised Samson. And then Ruth. Who gets an entire book. Ruth the famous. You know why she's an impossible figure? Because she's the impossible grandmother of David. And the odds are stacked against Ruth in, in a way that we haven't seen previously. When you read the beginning pages of Ruth, you've got three strikes against her. She's barren, she's now a widow, and she is a foreigner. There is no way she's going to have a son, and there's no way she's going to become the people of God. How in the world is she going to become an ancestor of Jesus? But God works the impossible. She's the impossible grandmother of David. And you know the story very well. As the book proceeds, suddenly there's Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, who looks like Jesus. There's Ruth who has the faith. And to her is born a son, and then a grandson, David. David, the mightiest king of Israel. David, to whom God promised the throne forever. David. Remember Matthew 1 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. And for hundreds of years, for centuries, the Jews knew that someday a deliverer would come, a redeemer would come for the seed of David. 
from Ruth, the impossible grandmother. Do you see again how God doesn't just spring up in the New Testament and say, here's my son? He's been sending us these foreshadowing hints as we add another ornament to the tree for Ruth. Then Hannah. Hannah who, who can't have children. Hannah who prays in the temple and she dedicates to God if God would just give her a child. And here he comes. Here comes Samuel. An almost perfect prophet of Israel. He's persecuted. He's pushed around. And yet he anoints both Samuel and David. He looks like Jesus. He is, he lingers. He lives in the tabernacle of his childhood. And where does the boy Jesus want to be in Jerusalem, in the temple? Hannah, the impossible mother, who gives birth to Samuel, who looks like Jesus. Hang another ornament for Hannah. And then we get to Elizabeth. The impossible mother of John the Baptist. Advanced in age, there's no hope for her in Zacharias to have children. But I push right to the boundary to be continued. You see, next week we continue with the upper branches, but I, I want us to know that as we think about God who does the impossible, God who works the miracle of bringing Jesus into the world to the virgin birth, God who brought him into the world to die for us, possible resurrection that we might be adopted. No, that it's built on the foundation of the lower tree. In the weeks ahead, we're going to see Zacharias and Elizabeth, to whom was born the impossible son. We're going to see Mary with the impossible faith. Joseph, who shows impossible obedience. And then Jesus, the impossible maker, the one who makes the impossible possible for all of us. We have celebrated today the gifts of God that he gives us hope and joy and peace. And the way we get them is for being with God. So the applications flow from that. Number one, receive the gift of adoption. Receive the gift of adoption. Please do that this season. Uh, you know, people enter the Christmas season and they know they're needy. They know they need things. I can't imagine you could find anybody who said, do you have any needs in December? They'd say, oh, I need help paying off my credit card. Or I need help paying for my electric bill. Or I need help because I'm, I'm grieving. I've had a death in the family. Or, or I have a sickness. You see, we're a needy people, aren't we? There are many things that you need. There are many things that I need. There are many gifts we need from God. But understand that the greatest gift is adoption. And it's possible for many people to do it. To go through this whole season and be thankful. You begin at Thanksgiving and with a thanks, thankful heart, you're thankful for all that God has given you, and you're asking God for gifts, and God may give them, and you can miss the greatest gift. The greatest tragedy is that all have been invited to be seen with God, and at the end of time, most will not have come. Most will enjoy the gifts of God's air and breath and life and joy and food and clothing and all that God's given them and education and family and, and friends and and shelter, and, and all these great gifts God has given, and they haven't received the greatest gift. So I wonder if I'm describing you, that you would say, I'm working my way to heaven, I, I'm trying to be good, and you need to say, it's impossible. It's impossible. I can't save myself. When we describe how somebody becomes a Christian, the first thing we say is you need to admit you're a sinner, and you don't deserve that. Right? Right? You say to God, it's impossible. I'll never meet your standards, God. I need a miracle. And then what do you do after you admit your sins? You believe that Jesus did it for you. And you say, God, I'm believing the impossible, that you would kill your son for me. I admit I'm not good enough. I believe, and I'm willing to publicly confess that. On Sunday, we witnessed that with the baptism in our church of an adult. Coming and saying, I want everybody to know that I'm now family of God. The greatest miracle that you could receive. Receive the gift of adoption this season. Come into God's family in the very season we celebrate God's family and His Son. Number two, offer the gift to others. People are particularly sensitive in this season. Christian, I'm talking to you. If there's ever an easier opportunity to invite somebody to church, to invite somebody to lunch, to take some Christmas cookie to somebody and share the gospel, it's this season. They're thinking about Jesus. And you can offer them the gift of a relationship with Jesus. 
You can invite them to your church. You can invite them into your home, and you can invite them to Jesus. Do that. Honor the God who brought you into this family by inviting others. Christianity is simply beggars telling other beggars how to find food. Or in this case, orphans telling other orphans how to find family. Receive the gift of adoption this season. Number two, offer the gift to others. Number three, now that you know that you have that adoption gift, ask God for those other possible gifts. Don't pray as a stranger. You see, believer, you don't pray and say, Dear God, uh, I know you don't really know who I am, and, and I'm not very significant, and I don't know if I can ask you for this. No, you come boldly to your Father, our Father, who is in heaven. Give us this day our labor, daily bread. Ask God for hope. Ask God to fill you with gospel hope for the future. Believer, your future will always be better than the present, and your present is always better than your past. It's an upward climb to glory. Ask God for peace. Ask God for joy. Ask God for courage. But ask them as children of God. God, I'm your child. I need the other gifts. What loving Heavenly Father will not do that for you? In fact, Jesus said to parents, he said, if you being evil can give good gifts to your children, will not your Father give them to you? So ask boldly. Children do. Here in this season, ask you for gifts. You ask your Heavenly Father for the other gifts. Number four. Enjoy being one Christmas place closer to home with your forever family. Enjoy being one Christmas closer to home with your forever family. On your best day in this world, you have nowhere the amount of joy you'll have in heaven. On your best day on earth, you have nowhere near the peace you'll have. This world is a pale, dying reflection of the glory and the joy and the hope that awaits you. And every Christmas, we say one more Christmas closer. Some of you, this will be your last Christmas. You don't know it. You don't know what disease you have. For some of you, your Christmases may be double digits. You may have 12 left or, or 50 or 80. But this year is one year closer to your forever family in heaven. And then God takes his family and it's a forever heaven and earth, a new heaven and earth, his glory to God, who brings us into his family by impossible adoption for his glory and our joy.